Dr. Katerina Fotopoulou, thank you so much for joining me for this first in a series of short interviews in the run-up to the Future of Neuroscience Conference on the 18th to 19th of May. You are due to present your research on the topic of embodied mentalization in anorexia nervosa. So I want to start by asking you in basic terms, what is embodied mentalization? The term embodied mentalization is easier to explain if we think of the term mentalization or its neighboring terms, theory of mind. The simple idea that we cannot read minds directly. All we see is behavior. We see people acting, we see people smiling or crying. The fact that we think that behind a cry, somebody is upset is us reading their mind, interpreting their behavior as though it is caused by a mental state. This is the idea of mentalization. The idea of embodied mentalization is that this process it fundamentally starts at the level of the body so that the body itself first developmentally needs to be read by others and then uh, we ourselves can read other people's bodies first and foremost rather than the mind and then attribute things to the body as causes. And so it's the idea that both our minds are in, um, uh, uh, embodied in a deep sense, but also the idea that our bodies are mentalized. And what I mean by this is that, for example, the mother's reactions to a baby's cry doesn't just soothe the body, it also soothes the mind. And these things go together so that when we are an adult and you formed a representation of your own body, that has already the stamp of another human being reacting to your bodily reactions. Your talk at the conference is about embodied mentalization in anorexia nervosa, but what other conditions do you consider embodied mentalization to play a critical role in? Well, embodied mentalization is almost sort of um, obvious in anorexia, and anybody who's worked with that population knows that even though the primary symptom is about food, behind that um, inability to um, uh, or unwillingness to enjoy and consume food um, lie a lot of more complex uh, feelings and ingrained attitudes about the self and how one feels about the self as a mind existing as a body. Um, and other similar um, disorders of the self, if you like, really relate to this idea of embodied mentalization. Um, a group of these disorders relate to things like stroke, where I've worked for many years and we find that people that have, as a result of stroke, deficits on their body don't just have a defective body. They feel their own subjectivity as people is altered and so is the relationship with other bodies and minds. So it's this constant link between our embodiment and our mental life. And other pathologies are, of course, other more psychopathological, if you have psychiatric disorders, uh, profound disorders of the self, such as borderline personality disorder. And of course, another obvious category, functional symptoms and somatization more broadly. So it's almost like I'm saying that for manifestations of somatization, there has not been enough or the right kind of mentalization. So the body is still too much body and um, very rigid rather than have become mentalized, abstracted and inferred in a correct way. How do you think an interdisciplinary dialogue between psychoanalysis and neuroscience can help in the clinic? Um, to be honest, I cannot imagine how anybody in the clinic would not want to take um, scientific um, insight into account. Now, by that, I don't mean that psychoanalysts or more broadly psychotherapists, when they work with their patients, they ought to aspire to be scientific. Not at all. They are very different things with very different traditions. But um, it is really important that in the back of our minds, while we'll have models of how the mind works, of how therapy works, of how intersubjective encounters work, we also include comparisons and knowledge coming out of science. It is in a way that I'm saying that um, psychoanalysis and other forms of psychotherapy are quite unique and irreducible to science. But at the same time, 
they are not sufficient. They need other fields, including science, in the same way that they need the patient. When we observe and we get to meet a patient, it's very easy to have our psychopathology textbook in mind. But our job is to keep that in the back of our mind. And when we are with the patient, um, engage fully with their story. It's a little bit the same with science. We need to also have in the back of our minds scientific models of the mind, but still fully engage with the patient in the room. Who do you think stands to gain in particular from attending this conference? I think this conference will be excellent for anybody currently practicing in the field of psychotherapy, particularly psychoanalytic psychotherapy, um, that will be interested in informing themselves about uh, current work in science, or particularly neuroscience, around issues of attachment, um, interpersonal variables in therapy, therapy effectiveness, and maybe also, um, particularly in, in relation to my work and the concept of embodied mentalization, uh, people that work with um, people that might have um, issues that relate not only to very abstract notions of mental health, but also how they feel in their body, things like sadness you feel in an embodied way, anxiety you feel in an embodied way, um, and uh, I would argue that most people feel a lot of their symptoms in an embodied way. And sometimes in therapy, we kind of forget the body of our client or patient in the corridor. Um, and also similar things can be said about how we embodied our attachment to relationships and generally how we build attachment relationships. I think all of these therapists, as well as scientists that uh, work on clinical topics and therefore can gain from psychoanalysis and uh, psychotherapies insight, would really benefit from attending this conference.